Well, we'll go ahead and get started this morning. I'm glad that you're here. This is, if you're making sure you're in the right class, this is the second week of six people uh, every Christian should know. And we're looking at people who are all either missionaries or connected uh, intimately to missions endeavors. So we'll do this class again at another point, and we might do, uh, we might do theologians, we might do uh, pastors, we might do some other sort of category, but this, this six weeks we're doing all, uh, all missionaries. And so last week we talked about David Brainerd, uh, and this week we're going to talk about a guy named Andrew Fuller. Um, he is, I think... If I had to choose, I think Andrew Fuller might be my favorite guy of the six that we're going to cover. Uh, the guy that I've read the most of uh, and have spent the most time with, uh, just in his writings and, and reading and learning about him. Uh, and I just like his, his story. So uh, let's, let's dive right in. Again, I'm going to give you, uh, I've given you some things in your handout. Uh, I've tried to, to make it easier for you to follow along and to take stuff home with you so that you don't have to write a ton. Um, do know I am by far the worst proofreader on staff. Uh, and I proofread my own stuff, so uh, just know there. I'm sure that there are errors in there, um, and I'm I'm working on getting better at that. Herschel has has stopped having me proofread his stuff. Uh, he <laughs> sends it to somebody else because he knows I'm so bad at it. Uh, so I've tried to give you stuff, and then throughout the morning, as we talk about Andrew Fuller, I'm going to read you sometimes lengthier quotes of him uh, as we study these people uh, these six weeks. I think it's important for us to hear them in their own words, to hear what they say. Um, the reason why we're able to study these folks is because they've written a lot, and a lot has been written about them. And so I want to, as, mo- as much as I can, let you hear them in their own words so that you hear um, what the Lord's done in their life and, and uh, hopefully learn and, and grow from it. So this week we're talking about Andrew Fuller. So uh, Andrew Fuller was born February 5th, 1754 in Cambridgeshire, England, and he died May 7th, 1815 in Ketterling, which is also there in England. Uh, Andrew Fuller was a Baptist. He was not a Southern Baptist, because Southern Baptists were not around yet. Uh, and he lived in, in England, but he was, he was a Baptist. Um, essentially what we're going to do, I'll take you through his life, sort of an overview of what he did. And then I want to talk about Andrew Fuller in different arenas in his life. So we'll talk about him as a husband and a father. We'll talk about him as a pastor, uh, as a theologian, and then as a, a missionary sending agent. Um, he didn't actually go on uh, uh, overseas missions, but he was, uh, had, a, had a huge hand in it. Um, so uh, he, he was born 1754, died 1815. So his early life, he was born to uh, Robert and Philippa. Guten was her, was her maiden name. Uh, and they rented and operated a dairy farm. They actually operated several in the course of his life that they wouldn't, because they didn't own the farm. They, they rented and leased and so moved to several different farms. Um, he was uneducated. He, he went through regular uh, primary school, but he didn't go to any college. He didn't have, have any secondary education. Um, when he was seven, he joined a particular Baptist church. Uh, and so I don't just mean like a specific one. That was, the, that was the denomination. They were called particular Baptist as opposed to general Baptist. And that's their, their view, essentially their view of atonement. And, uh, and so he joined a particular Baptist church in Soham at the age of seven, and the minister there was Reverend John Eaves. Now, it's important to, for us to understand what happened at this church and what was happening in this time period, even particularly amongst particular Baptist churches that really shaped uh, who Andrew Fuller was and shaped much of his ministry as he, uh, as he grew up. Uh, so he heard the gospel in this church, but he was never invited to repent and believe. So there was, at this time in England, and particularly in particular Baptist churches, uh, a movement of what has been called uh, hyper-Calvinism. So Fuller later in his life writes about high Calvinism, but, but often we would call it hyper-Calvinism, in which they said, we believe that we should speak about the bare facts of the gospel. We should say the gospel, but that we don't believe that we should call men to repent and believe. If they're going to repent and believe, then the Spirit will do that. We shouldn't even offer an invitation. We shouldn't we shouldn't invite men to believe. We shouldn't plead with them. We shouldn't ask them to be reconciled to God. That we'll talk about the facts of the gospel. We'll lay those things out, but we're not going to invite people to say, won't you believe? If you trust Christ today, you'll be safe. Or so there was this, this overemphasis there of the sovereignty of God, in which essentially they said, and we'll talk about this later because this becomes a huge point for Fuller as he writes against this, uh, in which they, they said, you know, we believe that men are fallen, that we're broken, that our wills are broken, uh, and because of that, 
that we can't come to Christ on our own, which I think we would affirm, I would affirm that. We don't come to Christ on our own. It's the Holy Spirit who does a work in us. And so they said, well, if we can't come to Christ on our own, well, then we must not be obligated to because God would not obligate us to something that we're unable to do. And so the unbelieving people in my church, they can't come to Christ on their own. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. So why would I invite them to trust Jesus? I'll let the Spirit do that. I'll let the Spirit handle that. And it began really an anti-missions movement. And so uh, in the course of like 60 years, the particular Baptist denomination went from like 240 congregations down to like 150 congregations. Uh, you can imagine why. They're not seeing people saved. They actually uh, said that it, they didn't think it was wise to send people to do cross-cultural missions. So they, they weren't sending people overseas. They weren't sending people to other areas to share the gospel. Uh, so this is the environment in which Andrew Fuller grows up. So he hears the gospel at seven years old. He knows the facts of it, but he was in an environment under a pastor who never invited people to come and trust the gospel. Right? So they would lay out, Jesus died, he was crucified, dead, and buried, he was raised on the third day. That's what they would say. There's no following up with, and if you trust Jesus, you'll be saved. Or I encourage you to, to trust Christ. I plead with you, what Paul says, on, on behalf of uh, God to be reconciled, or on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Or they didn't do that. So that's the environment in which Fuller is growing up in and, and then in which Fuller were minister in uh, later in life. So he heard the gospel but was never invited to, to repent and believe. So uh, you can imagine then as a young man, he struggles with salvation. Right, so that he was taught then, the way that you know that you're saved is not by some objective thing. It's not, you don't know you're saved because you know for sure that you've put your faith in Jesus. That he was taught, you know you're saved because you feel the subjective working of the Spirit in you. And if you feel the Spirit in you, then you must be saved. And so you can imagine as a 14, 15-year-old boy, Fuller is wrestling with these feelings of trying to figure out, am I saved or am I not saved? Because he's taught, you rely on the subjective feeling, not on an objective fact. Not that I know I'm saved because I put my faith in Jesus, but rather I know I'm saved because I feel something in me. I feel the Spirit working in me. So he wrestles through this in all sorts of ways. Uh, when he's, uh, he, he hopes that he could be saved, and he tries to convince himself often that he is. Uh, at the age of 14, he begins to, to really start reading. He reads uh, uh, Bunyan's, uh, two, really two books of Bunyan's that had a huge impact on him, Pilgrim's Progress. I'm curious, anybody in here read Pilgrim's Progress? Uh, if you've not read it, I encourage you to go and to read it. Uh, you can read the old English version or you can read an updated English version. It's a terrific book. I think it's one of the best books ever written in the English language. So if you've not read it, go read it. Uh, and then uh, the second book he read was Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And it was through these two books uh, of Bunyan's that, uh, um, that God began to do a work in Fuller. And he, he really wanted to be saved. He wanted to turn to Christ, but again, he found no help from his parents or from his pastor. And they were in this hyper-Calvinist, high-Calvinist uh, uh, environment. And so no one was really sort of helping him. He, he writes that he felt like a man who was drowning, who knew he needed to be saved, but he didn't know what to do. He, he wanted somebody to help him, but he, he didn't know where to turn. He didn't know what to do. Uh, in 1769, he's 15 years old, he goes for a walk. So you remember last week, uh, we talked about the salvation of David Brainerd. Where, where was David Brainerd saved? Anybody remember? Just going for a walk in the woods. Right? It's, it's just funny how this, the Lord does these things. So Fuller is a, he's 15 years old, uh, and he goes for a walk. And, and on this day, he is particularly burdened by his sins. He knows the gospel, and it's while he's out on this walk, he's contemplating his own sin. He's contemplating what he knows to, to be true in the gospel. And it's through this that the Lord saves him. It's, it's in this moment that he comes to Christ. I think I've put this salvation testimony in your book, but I'm going to read it for you. This is what, uh, what he writes. He says, I was not aware that any poor sinner had a warrant to believe in Christ for the salvation of his soul. Right? So he, he, was, not, he was never pressed to do that as an unbeliever. He says, but supposed there must be some kind of qualification to entitle him to it. Yet I was aware that I had no qualifications. On a review of my resolution at the time, it seemed to resemble that of Esther, who went into the king's presence contrary to law and at the hazard of her life. And like her, I seemed reduced to extremities, impelled by the dire necessity to run all hazards, even though I should perish in the attempt. Yet it, is, it was not altogether from a dread of wrath that I fled to this refuge, for I well remember that I felt something attracting in the Savior. I must, I will, yes, I will trust my soul, my sinful lost soul in his hands, and if I perish, I perish. However it was, I was determined to cast my soul upon Christ, thinking, peradventure, he would save my soul. 
So he's wrestling with and says, I didn't know that I had any qualifications to come to Jesus. Right? He'd never been called to. He never had that pressed upon him. But he is so overwhelmed by his sin that he compares his estate, his estate to Esther, who goes before the king knowing she goes at the, at the uh, cost of her own life, or at least at the risk of her own life. And so he says, I have nothing to do but to come to Jesus. And if I perish under the judgment of God in doing so, because he doesn't know if he should do that. He's never been told to do that. He says, but I, I've determined I have no other option. I, I must come to Jesus. I, I think it's a beautiful testimony, even in the midst of uh, really dark theological heresy uh, that would keep him from coming to Christ, that he's still saved, he still knows the gospel, he runs to Jesus. So he would say then um, that here at age 15 that he was saved. It's on this walk that he comes to saving uh, knowledge of Christ that he puts his, his faith uh, and, and trust there in Christ. So uh, just a few years later, in 1771, so just two years later, uh, Pastor John Eve leaves. There's a, a conflict, and, and he's asked to leave, and so he's no longer the pastor there. And so uh, Andrew Fuller, along with somebody else, began to fill the pulpit. Uh, and so they did, they did this for about two years. Fuller at the time was 17 when he, when he starts to preach. He'd only been a Christian for two years, and he was 17 years old, and he's preaching, uh, preaching here at the church. In 1775, he becomes the pastor at Soham, so he's 20 years old now. Uh, only been a Christian for five years, and preached for two years, and then now is the, is the pastor there at Soham. And he, will, he admits in his later writings that for the first few years of his pastorate, he suffered under the same theological issues that he grew up under. That he would preach the gospel, but he would not call on men to repent. He would not press that issue. He would not plead with men to put their faith in Jesus. He would sp- state the, fair back, the bare facts of the gospel, but he wouldn't do that. So he, obviously we're going to see he has a change in his, in his theology. Why is that so him? And it's part of what makes things uh, hard for him and difficult, why he leaves to go to another church, uh, is that he does come to the conviction that we ought to call him to repent and believe, that we ought to, to invite people to trust Jesus, that we should be calling people to respond. Uh, so he pastors there for seven years. Uh, and then he reluctantly take, becomes the pastor of another uh, particular Baptist church in Kettering. Uh, so he moves to Kettering in 1782, uh, and then he pastors Kettering until his death in 1815. He dies as pastor uh, of, that, of that church there, so he only pastored two churches in his life. In 1792, and we'll talk about this more later, he founds uh, the Particular Baptist Society for Propagating of Gospel Among the Heathens. Uh, if you read these guys, you read their writings, you know they love long names. Uh, they, just, it's just what they loved. And so uh, eventually that was shortened to Baptist Missionary Society. So he forms this society, the particular Baptist Society for Propagating of the Gospel Among the Heathens. He forms that in 1792 along with 13 other pastors. And at the time it was a sort of a ragtag group. We'll talk more about sort of what they do. Uh, they were not some big industrial complex. They didn't have a ton of money. Uh, they passed a snuff can around the first time that they met to collect money. Uh, and they had very little money. Um, but the Lord uses the Baptist Missionary Society in a huge way to launch what we would consider modern missions. Uh, so we'll talk about William Carey next week and even a little later today. William Carey is considered the father of the modern, the modern missions movement. William Carey is sent out by the Baptist Missionary Society. He and Fuller are really good friends. And so uh, what God's doing in this Baptist Missionary Society, though uh, a really small start, is used in, in great measure uh, to start some really cool stuff, um, really st- cool stuff down the line. So let's talk about his family. He was married in 1776, so he, he became the pastor in 1775. He got married that next year uh, to a girl named Sarah Garnier. So much like Brainerd, uh, Andrew Fuller was reunited with suffering. Uh, his life was difficult. His life was hard. Um, you'll see he's married twice. He loses a wife. Uh, he's married in 1776. They have 11 children. Eight of his children with Sarah die in infancy or childhood. Uh, eight of his 11, so three um, survive. Um, so he has 11 children with her. He has six with his other wife, with, with Ann Cole, uh, for a total of 17. And, I, and I, I read the, the number this week, and I want to say four of his children outlived him. Um, it may not be that high. Uh, most of his children did not outlive him. A lot of them died in infancy. So uh, his wife, Sarah, died in 1792. Uh, at the end of her life, she, we don't know exactly what she had, but she essentially had a break with reality, some sort of mental illness where she became fearful of Andrew and her family. She thought that Andrew was holding her captive and keeping her from her real family. 
Um, she was not co- coherent most of the time. Uh, she literally lost her mind for about six months. Uh, there was one day in that six months that she comes to and is able to, like, to talk to him and say, I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, I'm scared. And, and he has one, one good day with her um, uh, in that last six months of her life before she passes away. Uh, so she dies in 1794, or 1792. Two years later, he remarries. He marries uh, Anne Coles. They have six children together, uh, three of which die in infancy. Uh, and Anne Coles actually outlives him uh, by 10 years. So she, she dies in 1825. Uh, he died in 1815. Uh, he dies then on May 7th, 1815. Uh, he was still writing, still pastoring, uh, and he was still the president of that Baptist Missionary so- uh, Society that he, uh, along with 13 other people, launched uh, in 1792. So let's talk about Andrew Fuller. Uh, any questions, first off, on just overview of his life? Let's talk about him as a husband and a father. So I think sometimes when we talk about major impact of guys like Fuller, we're tempted, I think, to go first to what they did uh, as theologians, what they did as missionaries or preachers, uh, and to overlook who they were as people, who they were as, as family men, as husbands and, and fathers. Uh, and, and I would argue that in ministry, uh, that if you lose your family, you lose your ministry. And so uh, one of the things that I like to look at when I read about a guy is what kind of husband was he? What kind of father was he? And sometimes you, you, you find out sad stories that a guy was doing awesome things Outside of his home, he was writing and preaching and doing all these things, but often that came at the expense of his family and of, of his children. Um, and so Fuller struggles with that some. Uh, we, we, we do have letters, especially from Anne, um, from his second wife. That she writes to, to friends um, after his death that at least the last few years, sometimes they struggle just to have a conversation because he was so busy and doing other things. Um, but generally, that wasn't true of him. Andrew Fuller, um, by all accounts, was a godly husband and a godly father. Uh, and so that's always encouraging to me to look and to see God's used a guy in a great way outside of his home, but who was he first? Who was he as a husband? Who was he as a, as a father? So uh, by all accounts, he was a good husband uh, to both Sarah and Anne. Uh, so their marriage was 1776 to 1792, we said. Um, they did have a, a healthy marriage founded on the mutual love of God. She, she grows sick um, at, the end, at the end of that marriage, and she loses her mind. Uh, upon her death, he writes, uh, Poor soul. What she often said is now true. She was not at home, and I am not her husband, and these are not her children. But she has found her home, a home, a husband, and a family uh, better than these. Uh, You can tell in his his writings uh, that he loved her deeply. He writes a poem um, uh, uh, after her death. He writes two, one when she dies, and then another uh, about a year after she dies. The end of the poem that he writes at her death says, The tender parent wails no more her loss. Nor labors more beneath life's heavy load. The anxious soul, released from fears and woes, has found her home, her children, and her God. Um, he, he writes there, we'll talk about in just a second, about um, one, one of the children that they lost in infancy. And so he, he says, now she, this, this parent wails no more for her loss, that she's with the Lord. Uh, on the first anniversary of her death, he writes, There once did live a heart that cared for me. I loved and was again beloved in turn. Her tender soul would soothe my rising griefs and wipe away my tears and mix them with her own. But she is not, and I, forlorn, am left to weep unheeded and to serve alone. Uh, And all of his writings is really clear that he loves his wife. Uh, He was a good husband. He was a good father uh, to to Sarah uh, and then grieved her death um, immensely. Uh, His marriage to Anne uh, was much the same from what from his writings and her writings and the writings of their friends. Um, Sarah, or Anne, was rather a really godly woman, uh, helped to raise their children really well. There are uh, um, writings, Andrew Fuller, Andrew Gutenfuller, which is his son, um, uh, tells a story once of, of coming in and he sees his mother pacing in her bedroom uh, talking and says, Mom, who, who are you talking to? And she says, I'm talking to God, and I'm talking to God about you, and I'm praying for your salvation. And he remembers very vividly, he was six or seven years old, that she sat him down and, and uh, had a really good conversation with him about not just salvation, but about prayer and what she was doing, why she was praying for him. Um, she's a really godly woman, again, a, a, a godly marriage. They loved each other and cared each other uh, for each other well. Uh, she does write to a friend, uh, to John Ryland, who was a, was a good friend of both Fuller and Anne, um, that at the end of his life, uh, especially the last four or five years, that they struggled sometimes just to have time together. 
because of all that he was doing. He was pastoring, he was writing as a theologian, uh, he was running the Baptist Missionary Society, so we'll talk about all that involves, but it's a lot of travel, a lot of speaking at other places. And so she does say, she wished essentially that he would have managed his time a little better, uh, which I think all of us would say that. If we had the foresight to look back at our life, we would say we wish we would have managed our time better, but she does say that. But she writes to, to Ryland in that same letter, overall, I must testify his, his domestic character to have been ever since I had the happiness of being united to him of the most amiable and endearing kind. He writes really, really kindly of her time uh, married to, to Andrew Fuller. So uh, it's, it's I, I think, a testament to his character that two of the people that speak most high of him are the, the ladies that were married to him. Uh, if anybody would know his warts and then know his, his uh, shortcomings, it would be his wife. And they both write uh, really glowingly of their marriage to him and, and what a godly man he was. Um, probably more than anything, I, I am uh, moved by uh, moved by his, the way that he was. Actually, I thought I'd put some more in here. I've got some stuff I want to read to you about him as a father. Um, I'm moved more by anything, I think, um, more than him as a husband, by him as a father. Um, he, he's got writings in his own journals about his um, about his stuff, uh, his conversations with his with his children. Um, he was a loving and godly father by all accounts. Um, he, he sought very intentionally to lead his kids to the Lord. Like Anne, he prayed for them. He had, he had conversations with them. Uh, he, he writes that the characters of men are not so easily ascertained from a few splendid actions as from the ordinary course of life in which their real dispositions are manifested. Essentially, how you know who somebody is is in their ordinary life, not in the big, extraordinary things that they do. Um, he has a daughter, uh, Sarah Fuller, who he loved very dearly. It was, I, I believe, the first of his children to die. I told you uh, uh, he lost eight of the 11 in, uh, in infancy um, or early childhood with Sarah. Sarah was named after her mother. Um, she dies at, at the age of six years old. Uh, and this, this really hit Andrew very hard. He actually was so grieved by her death that in the f- just the, leading, the, the few days leading up to her death, he became so ill. Uh, with grief, that he was not actually able to be with her uh, when she died. Uh, He was so overcome by grief. Uh, He writes, though, uh, just some really sweet conversations that he he has with her. So uh, um, he has, he writes about this conversation that he had with her once. They're visiting their friend, John Ryland, and she uh, asks him about prayer. And so she comes to him and she says, Father, will you pray for me? And he says, what do you wish me to pray for, my dear? She says that God would bless me and keep me and save my soul. He says, do you think you are a great sinner? Yes, Father. Well, what is sin, my dear? It's telling a story or or lying. You remember, do you, my having corrected you once for having told a story? Yes, Father. Are you grieved for having so offended God? Yes, Father. Do you try to pray for yourself? I sometimes try, Father, but I do not know how to pray, and I wish that you would pray for me until I can pray for myself. She says, then, I'm afraid that I should go to hell. She says, my dear, who told you so? She says, nobody, but I know that if I do not pray to the Lord, I must go to hell. And then he, he writes then that he, he went to pray with her with many tears. And so he sits with his daughter and he explains the gospel and he calls her to trust Jesus. And he prays for her and he prays with her and he prays over her. Uh, just a tender moment of a father with his daughter who would die uh, not, not too long after. Um, not long after that, again, they are uh, reading the scripture. He's reading the Bible to her. And he sees that she's really upset. He sees that she's uh, grieved over something. So he, he says, are you afraid that you will not go to the blessed world of which we have been reading? She says, yes. But what makes you afraid, my dear? I have sinned against the Lord. True, my dear, you have sinned against the Lord. But the Lord is more ready to forgive you if you are grieved for offending him than I can be to forgive you when you are grieved for offending me. And you know how ready I am to do that. And then he spends time with his daughter talking about the love of Jesus and the grace that comes from him. I, I, and I read these things as a, as a, a dad of a little girl. I mean, it, it, it touches me. Uh, it, I'm moved by just him as a father with his kids, being gracious and gentle and kind. If you read his theological writings, he's a guy who doesn't back down. He's a guy that's not afraid to call a spade a spade, and yet he's gentle with his children. And as intentional to share the love of Christ with them. Um, she dies at the age of six, um, and he was so grieved, um, so grieved over her death, uh, so that he was sick with it in himself and could not be with her. 
Uh, he loses another, another daughter named Ann Fuller. Uh, he writes after her death, O oh, our Redeemer and our God, our help in tribulation, hear our fervent prayer. To thee we now resign the sacred trust, which thou erewhile didst unto us commit. Soon we must quit our hold and let her fall. Thine everlasting arms be then beneath. In thee a refuge may she find in death, and in thy bosom dwell, when torn from ours. Into thy hands her spirit we commit, and hope ere long to meet and part no more. Uh, he loves his kids, and he's grieved over their death. He, uh, he has an older son named Robert, Robert Fuller, who was a wayward son who, who ran away from the faith, um, who stole from his father, who, who got himself into all sorts of trouble. Later in life, Robert joins the Marines, so he's out on a boat, and Andrew gets a letter from Robert asking for his forgiveness. Uh, he's, he's at least come to himself to that, to that much that he's understood that his father has been riding with him and pleading with him to come back, to trust the Lord, and to repent. And he's not done it, and so he finally, as he's on this boat uh, out in the middle of the ocean, he writes this letter and asks his dad, to forgive him, and so uh, Andrew writes to him, My dear son, I am now 55 years old and may soon expect to go the way of all the earth. But before I die, let me teach you the good and the right way. You have had a large portion of God's preserving goodness, or you had, ere now, perished in your sins. Nevertheless, do not despair, for as far as you have gone and as low as you are sunk in sin, yet if from hence you return to God by Jesus Christ, you will find mercy." Uh, that he writes and he, he, t- he tells it, Robert that he's happy to forgive him and he tells him about the mercy and the grace that's available to him if he'll trust Jesus. Not long after this, Robert gets sick uh, and dies while on the boat. Uh, and Andrew, uh, in his lifetime, never hears, he never knows if his son is saved. He never knows uh, if his son is, has trusted Christ. Uh, we do know that Andrew's older son, Andrew Gutenfuller, uh, hears from later in life after Andrew Fuller's death, hears later in life from a shipmate who had said that Robert had trusted Christ. Uh, and so Andrew never got to learn that in this life, but we do know at least there's testimony that they, they say that his father's letter had an effect on him and he did trust the Lord. Um, the Sunday after his son dies, he, he's preaching through the book of Jonah. Uh, and he, he, he uh, says this um, in his sermon, Some are far from home and have no friend, in their dying moments, to speak a word of comfort. But this is near. When Jonah was compassed about by floods, when the billows and waves passed over him, he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord heard him. And and at that point, he he ended up ending the sermon. He he just broke down uh, as he thought about um, his own son dying out at sea, and he just wept. Uh, He didn't know if his son was saved, but he was comforted by the fact that when Jonah cried out to the Lord, the Lord heard him. And so he knew that if his son cried out to the Lord, the Lord would hear him. And he, he actually just has to quit preaching. He just weeps. And the congregation weeps with him. Um, it's a guy who loves his family, who loves his wife, who loves his kids, uh, who's uh, deeply tender and compassionate with them, who is very intentional in sharing the gospel with them. Uh, Robert was uh, a guy who would have tried all of our patience and the things that he did. And yet, as soon as he asks forgiveness, Andrew is happy to write and, and speak of his love for him and to offer forgiveness and to point him to Jesus, to point him to the grace and mercy. So even aside from all that we're going to talk about, he does as a theologian, as a pastor, as a sending agent uh, in a missionary organization, that what he does as a husband and father are, are exemplary, that he is a, a model for us of what, of what that looks like. Um, is a man who, who uh, I think, honored God in the way that he, he lived his life and the way that he, he cared for his, his kids and for his family. Uh, let's talk about Andrew Fuller as a pastor now. So we said he preached and pastored in Soham. He pastored there for seven years, preached there for nine, if you count the two that he, um, that he pastored, um, and then pastored in 30, for 33 years in Kettering, so 40 years altogether of, of pastoral ministry. Um, he, especially later in his life, became an expositor, pre, uh, expository preacher. Um, so you can see that list there. Beginning in, in 1790, he ex- expounded successfully he went through these in a row, uh, verse, verse by verse. Psalms, Isaiah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Genesis, Matthew, Luke, John, Revelation, Acts, Romans, and 1 Corinthians. He made it to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 before he died. Uh, he was an expositor. He, especially later in life, he walked his people through um, through the books of the Bible. He walked them verse by verse. He fed them well. 
Uh, he was, by all accounts, a tremendous preacher uh, and loved to preach. It was his, the first thing he did in ministry was preaching. Um, he was a really good shepherd. So even though he was a busy guy, and we'll talk more about the Baptist Missionary Society and all of his theological writing that took a lot of his time, he was a good pastor that his congregants write of his care for them, of what a good shepherd that he was for them. Uh, he writes, uh, we, we have lots of letters that he writes to people who are wayward church members. And he writes, he takes the time to write and to seek after them and to, and to try to bring them back to church. Uh, he writes once to a wayward church member, when a parent loses a child, which he knows what that, looks, what that feels like, he says, when a parent loses a child, nothing but the recovery of that child can heal, heal the wound. If he could have many other children, that would not do it. Thus it is with me towards you. Nothing but your return to God and to the church can heal the wound. He's writing to somebody who's left the faith, and he says, it doesn't matter if I get 40 other people. I want you. I want you to return to to God. Um, And we have countless letters of fuller writing to church members like that. Uh, Faithful shepherd, faithful pastor, preached the word, cared well for his people. Uh, We have in his own journals, he he writes that he wishes that he had... uh, more time. Uh, he says, I wish I had more time to visit with my church people so that I can know more of what's going on in their life so that as I preach, I can preach more to their specific circumstances and to things that are going on. Um, and he did. He spent as much time with his people as he could. Um, and um, by all accounts, his deacons, other people in his church uh, wrote about how what an exemplary pastor he was, that they, they really enjoyed him uh, as a pastor. His biggest in- influence, though, did not come as a pastor. His biggest influence came in the next two things we're going to talk about. Uh, that we, Andrew Fuller is a theologian, and Andrew Fuller is a, is a part of the and president of the Baptist Missionary Society, had the longest, deepest, uh, re- reaching impact uh, as, far, as far as his ministry is concerned. So remember we said he grew up in a, in a time that was dominated by particularly, especially in the particular Baptist uh, churches, by hyper-Calvinism, or, or what he called high-Calvinism. Uh, and essentially, they dealt with this, uh, what they called the modern question. And here's the modern quest- question. Uh, whether it be the duty of all men to whom the gospel is published to repent and believe in Christ. Remember, they're saying, well, men don't have the ability in and of themselves to believe the gospel. The, the, the Spirit has to do a work in them. The Spirit has to help them because we're, we're depraved. We are broken. Even our wills are broken. We don't want to believe the gospel. So there was the folks on the high Calvinist side, the hyper Calvinist side, who were saying... Well, if there's no ability, then God will not obligate a man to, to repent and believe. If he doesn't have the ability to do it, then he's not obligated to do it, and thus we shouldn't call on him to do it. He can't do it. We'll just leave. If people are going to be saved, they'll be saved, and the Spirit will do it. Right? There are no means. We don't need to do any of that stuff. Uh, we'll let the Spirit do all that. We're not, we'll, we'll state the bare facts, but we don't think, uh, not only do we don't think that uh, it's something that we're required to do, we don't think it's a good idea to call people to repent and believe that we think it's wrong, that we, we don't want to implore people to trust Christ. So Fuller grew up in this. He comes to an understanding at Soham that this is not biblical, uh, that he shouldn't just be preaching the gospel, that ultimately to preach the gospel is to call people to repent and believe the gospel, that stating the bare facts uh, isn't full, faithful preaching of the gospel, that, that he comes to the conviction that scripturally he ought to be calling people to faith. One of the things that uh, I appreciate about Fuller the most is in his writings and his preaching and his pastoring uh, and what he does as a missionary agent, everything he does, he tries to go back to the scriptures. He tries to say, what does the Bible say? That's what I want to say. And he tries to be governed by them as best, uh, as best he can. So he writes a book uh, in 1785. He, he began to write it while at Soham. Uh, he finished it. The first edition comes out in 1785. So by that point, he's already at, Ketter, at Kettering. Uh, so he writes a book called The Gospel Worthy of All Acceptation or The Duty of Sinners to Believe. So he writes a book to combat this hyper-Calvinist notion uh, that people should not be, uh, should not be uh, trusting Christ. He writes uh, describing their reasoning this way. Uh, it is absurd and cruel to require of any man what is beyond his power to perform. And as the scriptures declare that no man can come to Christ except the Father draw him, and that natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It is concluded that these things, uh, that these are things to which the sinner, while ungenerate, is under no obligation. Right? So that's him describing their, um, their viewpoint, their argument. So he writes then to combat that. Uh, he writes then to say, that we actually ought to be exhorting people and calling them to repent, uh, to repent in Jesus. Uh, 
he makes uh, a, a distinction, and I don't want to camp here for a long time, but he, he uh, was really influenced by Jonathan Edwards. So we talked about Edwards some last, last week. Who really influenced Jonathan Edwards? David Brainerd was a huge influence in Edwards. Edwards wrote uh, extensive theological works, and Fuller is really influenced by Edwards' writings. And, and, Edward, and, and Fuller, with the help of reading Edwards and reading the Bible, he helps to make a distinction between what he calls natural inability and moral inability. So he says that we are unable to believe the gospel. Yes, on our own, we cannot do it on our own. But it's not a natural inability. It's not something that our, we don't possess natural ability to. He says, no, it's a moral inability. The reason we can't believe the gospel on our own is because our wills are broken. It's because we don't want to believe the gospel. And so uh, I try to, to give you an example of, sort of what that means. Right, so if I ask Elizabeth, who my daughter is, she'll be three in just a couple weeks. If I ask her to go mow the yard, is it right then for me to be angry? If I go, if I go to work tomorrow and I come back and I, I, before I leave I say, you need to mow the yard. And I come back and my, my, my yard is not mowed. Is it right then for me to be angry with her that she has not done what I've asked her to do? No, Why? She's not physically able. She does not have the natural ability, right? Even if she wanted to, she could not go out and mow my yard. She physically cannot do it. And so what Fuller says is, that's not the sort of inability that we have. Now, if I left and I said, Elizabeth, your toys are all over your room. You know where these go. When I come home today, your room needs to be cleaned up. Now, if I come home and her room is still a mess, is it right then for me to be uh, uh, frustrated that she has not done what's been asked. Yes. Because if she hasn't done what she's, what she's been asked to do, it's not because she doesn't have the ability to do it, it's because she lacks the moral ability to do it. She doesn't want to do it. And so that's what Fuller says, that it's not that we lack the natural ability to believe the gospel, we lack the moral ability, that we in our sin are broken, that our wills are broken, that we don't want to come to God on our own. The Spirit must do a work in us. That this is what He says. This is what He says. This is what He thinks that Jesus means by "No one comes to the Father unless the Father comes to me unless the Father draws him." That on our own, our eyes are darkened, our ears are closed, our hearts are our hearts of stone, and that the Spirit is who livens us, who opens up our eyes, who opens up our ears, who softens our hearts so that we can believe the gospel. That our problem is not our natural ability, but our moral ability that we don't want to. So He says, "God is not wrong to hold us accountable for what we don't want to do." That we could believe the gospel, but we don't want to believe the gospel. The problem is the problem of our will. So yes, we are obligated to believe the gospel, and so then we should preach the gospel to people. Uh, so he makes this distinction then between moral, natural ability and moral ability. Uh, and he writes, uh, if this be saving faith. Uh, so he writes here about, I remember I told you earlier, uh, hyper-Calvinists said, uh, that the reason you know you're saved is because you feel some subjective working of the Spirit in you. Right? Because it's, that's, what, that's how you know you're saved. If the Spirit's working in you, you must be elect, you must be saved. Where Fuller says, no, 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 that's ridiculous. You're not saved by some subjective feeling. You're saved by Jesus. And so if you have objectively put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you're saved. That it's the object of your faith that saves you, not some subjective feeling in you. And so that's why he says we ought to, to call men to repent and believe. So he says... Uh, if this be saving faith, speaking of what they say, it must inevitably follow that it is not the duty of unconverted sinners, for they are not interested in Christ. That is, they are not yet united to him, and it cannot be, possibly be their duty to believe a lie. But if it can be proved that the proper object of saving faith is not our being interested in Christ, that is, our being already united with him, that's that feeling of something happening in you. He says, if that's not the case, but the glorious God of the ever-blessed God, which is true, whether we believe it or not, a contrary inference must be drawn, for it is admitted on all hands that it is the duty of every man to believe what God reveals. And nothing can be an object of faith except what God has revealed in his word. But the interest that any individual has in Christ is not revealed. The scriptures always represent faith as terminating on something outside of us, namely on Christ and the truths concerning him. The person, blood, and righteousness of Christ revealed in the scriptures as the way of a, of a sinner's acceptance with God are properly spoken the object of our faith. For without such a revelation, it were impossible to believe in them. That for which we ought to have trusted in him was the obtaining mercy in case he applied for it. For there was a complete warrant in the gospel declarations. So he says, 
The scriptures have always said that faith terminates outside of ourselves. We don't have faith in us, we have faith in Jesus. Because the gospel is revealed to us by the word. And so it's, that's what we put our faith in, not some subjective feeling. And it says, if that's what our faith is in, then absolutely we should be calling people to put their faith in Jesus. Absolutely we should be uh, telling people and pleading with them, exhorting them, inviting them to trust Jesus. So he writes, I believe it is the duty of every minister of Christ, plainly and faithfully, to preach the gospel to all who will hear it. And as I believe the the inability of men to do spiritual things, to be holy of the moral and therefore of the criminal kind, and it, that it is their duty to love the Lord Jesus Christ and to trust him for salvation, though they do not, I therefore believe free and solemn addresses, invitations, calls, and warnings to them to be not only consistent, but directly adapted as means in the hands of the Spirit of God to bring them to Christ. I consider it as part of my duty that I could not omit without being guilty of the blood of souls. Says, I believe I have a duty to call, to invite, to address, to warn men, to trust Jesus. And he says he believes that that's a means by which God uses through the Spirit to draw men to himself. And he says that he would be guilty. Blood would be on his hands if he were to preach the gospel and not call people to repent. So he's writing. Uh, so there are other guys who are writing at the time who are writing opposite of him. Um, so this is at, at a time, we don't really do this much anymore, uh, in which uh, when ideas were circulating, men would, would write treatises against each other and, and really trying to argue ideas. So he would write, somebody else would write against him, and he would write more. Um, this is sort of like a sophisticated Facebook wall, right? So uh, they're, they're sort of going back and forth uh, with, with arguments. So there are people writing against him, and he writes other theological, on other theological issues. I think this is the most important thing that he writes on. Um, I've got a copy of this book if you want it. Uh, I believe you can get the PDF online for free, uh, the gospel worthy of all acceptation. Uh, I think it went through three edits in which he added things. Uh, I believe you can get it online um, as a PDF uh, on, online for free or an ebook or other formats. You can order a hard copy. Most of the time you can get it for like seven bucks, seven, eight bucks. It's, it's not an expensive book. It's not a long book. I would encourage you, if you're interested in Fuller's writing, to open up and read it. It's, it's Fuller taking apart that hyper-Calvinist argument piece by piece and saying, no, we believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We believe in calling people to repent. We believe, yes, the Spirit must do a work, but we believe the Spirit uses means. And so we're going to preach the gospel to as many people as we can, and we're going to plead with those people as often as we can and as passionately as we can that they ought to trust Jesus. Right? That's what gospel ministry looks like. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage you to pick up that book and, and to read it. His theological writing then flows into what he does as a missionary sending agent. Uh, so I told you in the particular Baptist uh, uh, churches, they went from about 220, 225 congregations down to about 140, 150 congregations. And you can see why. If they're not sharing the gospel, they're not reaching people, they're not even inviting people to trust Jesus, that as people die, congregations die. Well, Fuller is now writing against them. He's now uh, uh, writing against hyper He's writing for the free offer of the gospel to anybody and everybody that will hear it. And so he begins this new wave of missionary activity, not just in England, but, but overseas. And it's his theological writing, um, particularly the gospel worthy of all acceptation, that provides then the theological underpinnings for what we would consider the modern missions movement. So he, he begins in 1792. He launches the particular Baptist Society for the propagating of gospel, the gospel among the heathens. Right, later changed the Baptist Missionary Society. He was the president. He remained the president for the last 23 years of his life until he died. There were 14 small uh, church pastors who I told you they, the first time they met, they passed around a snuff can to collect money to, to send missionaries. Um, there are most of the other folks we, you wouldn't know. We've talked about John Ryland, so that he was a good friend of Fuller's. Much of what we know about Fuller's life is because of the writings of John Ryland. John writes about Fuller. Uh, Andrew Fuller was there, and then a guy named William Carey, who we'll talk about next week, uh, who was one of the first guys that the Baptist Missionary Society sends out. Uh, those were three of the 14 that were there, but at the time they were really nobodies. They were 14 small church pastors that nobody really knew of. They gathered together and said, we want to take the gospel to places that it's not yet gone. Um, so they began their uh, uh, what we would consider the modern, modern missions movement. So they, they got together. Uh, they started this Baptist Missionary Society. They sent out uh, William Carey and John Thomas to India in 1793. It's the first people they sent uh, in 1793, so just a year after they started. And until he died, Fuller spent his life uh, 
uh, writing pamphlets, uh, writing letters both to missionaries on the field and to churches to raise support for those missionaries. He would travel extensively to preach at places to raise money in order to send those missionaries. So this was really the first sending agency in which people were being sent to other countries and, and money was being sent to them to, in order for them just to stay there uh, in sort of a modern way. I would argue that's essentially what Paul did. Uh, Paul was going to places and was being supported by churches. But Fuller travels around. He raises money. He's preaching. He's writing. He's writing letters. He's writing letters to churches, to missionaries. He spends a good deal of his time as the president of the Baptist Missionary Society promoting the work in which they're doing, and particularly with Kerry in, in India. Um, you've probably, if you remember when Zach left, uh, anybody get one of the orange ropes from Zach? Uh, anybody do the, like, the coffee and dessert thing with the Thurmans before they left? Uh, why did they give you the orange rope? Yeah, it's a reminder of them, and it's a reminder of the phrase that we hold the rope, right? We're sending them out, but we're, we're holding the rope. So Fuller in the Baptist Missionary Society is where that phrase comes from. If you ever heard that phrase, we're, we're holding the rope when we talk about missions. So what, we sent the Thurmans to Fort Collins, and we're sending the, uh, uh, the Samsons to Fort Collins in just a few weeks. We're sending them out there, but we're holding the rope. That comes from this meeting that happens early uh, in the life of the Baptist Missionary Society before they send out. Uh, Thomas and Carrie, they're about to leave. They're going to leave soon. Uh, Ryland writes of this meeting that they all had together before Carrie left for India. He says, Our undertaking to India really appeared to me on its commitment, commencement to be somewhat like a few men who were deliberately about the importance of penetrating a deep mine which had never been explored, and we had no one to guide us. And while we were thus deliberating, Carrie, as it were, said, Well, I will go down if you will hold the rope. But before he went down, he, as it seemed to me, took an oath from each of us at the mouth of that pit to this effect, that while we lived, we should never let go of the rope. Uh, and so Fuller spends his life uh, as best he can uh, with that conviction to never let go of the rope. I, I think that's a beautiful image of missions, especially missions in a, in a time in which they're going to India not really knowing much about India. They're going, he said, he describes it like going into a pit. And it's dark, and they don't know what's down there, and no one's going to guide them. And he says, I'll go, but you hold the rope. And so that's what they did. That's what Fuller spent his life doing as a part of the Baptist Missionary Society, holding the rope. He didn't go to India himself, but he held the rope. Uh, he made it possible for Kerry and Thomas, and then later down the line for other people to go um, because uh, of what he did. And it was, in many ways, this society was grounded on the theological underpinnings. Right, the things that Fuller had been writing, his theological teaching, his preaching that helped to, to ground uh, what, they, what they'd been doing. Uh, it was his call to the preaching of the gospel uh, of, to all people across all societies to the ends of the earth that stirred up and carry this notion that they should start a missionary society, that they should send people to other places. Um, on his death, um, about two weeks before his death, John Ryland writes, his, his friend writes, I have preached and written, uh, writes... Uh, um, Sorry, he writes this to John Riley. This is Fuller writing to John two weeks before his death. I have preached and written against the abuse of the doctrines of grace, but that, that doctrine is all my salvation and all my desire. I have no other hope than from salvation by mere sovereign, efficacious grace through the atonement of my Lord and Savior. With this hope, I can go into eternity with composure. That two weeks before his death, he says, I've written against the abuse of the grace of God, but it is my only hope that I would be saved by a gracious Savior. Uh, and it's his, it's his theological underpinnings that help to, to do this. So uh, let's take a couple minutes here, and uh, I'll take some questions. I want to hear from you, but I want to talk about at least a couple uh, big impacts that we have from him. One of the things I think that we learn most about Fuller and from Fuller is about the importance between relation, the relationship between theology and missions. Uh, so sometimes you might hear somebody, if you're talking about a sending agency or you're talking about um, missionaries going on the field. So if you go through the, the International Mission Board, which is the Southern Baptist arm, uh, the sending agency internationally, uh, those ghost, ghost guys throw, go through a really intense vetting process. They're looking at their health. They're looking at their family. They're looking at uh, their theology. They're looking at their mental health. They're, they're, they're looking at all the, the things that, that sort of encompass them, what they believe about the scriptures, where they are theologically. And, and sometimes, every now and then, you might hear somebody say, well, I wish we wouldn't quibble so much about that theological stuff. I just we would just be about missions, right? Shouldn't we just be about getting Jesus to people? Shouldn't we just be about missions? Why do we have to always talk about theolo theological stuff? Fuller teaches us why it matters that we talk about theological stuff. 
Because if you get the theology wrong, there won't be any missions. And maybe even worse, if you get the theology wrong, maybe you'll still do, go do missions, but you'll bring the wrong message. And a false gospel does not save. So he teaches us the incredible importance between theology and missions. That if Fuller, God doesn't use Fuller in the way that he does, then the particular Baptist denomination dies out completely and the Baptist Missionary Society never gets started. Right? That they're not, they're not preaching the gospel. They're not calling people to repent. Not because they didn't care about missions, but because their theology God uses to help correct their theology so that missions can take place in a proper way, so that people then are actually called to repent and believe in Jesus. That there is an intense relationship between theology and missions. It does matter what we believe, and what we believe will affect the way we do missions. It will affect where we go, how we go, what we say when we get there, uh, and the, the way that we say things when we get there. These things are intensely connected. So when somebody says, uh, well, I wish we wouldn't talk theology, I wish we would just talk about getting Jesus to places, you say, you need to read the gospel of all acceptation, worthy of all acceptation. You need to read Andrew Fuller, because uh, it does matter. Uh, and a, even maybe even in a broader way, God uses Fuller to start, I've said, what we call the, the, the modern missions movement. So Carey was the father of the modern missions movement, because he was the, the first missionary, uh, but Fuller provides all the underpinning and is the guy holding the rope there. Uh, so if we, we were to talk about modern missions, we sort of Think about it in at least three eras. So beginning in 1793, when Carey and Thomas go to India, to about 1865, the missionary uh, movement reached almost every coastland. So almost every ge- geographical uh, region in the world had a missionary there, had the gospel there. Right? That's not doesn't mean everybody there believed or every area had the gospel. But up until that point, there were places, there were coastlands that had never had a missionary go there. And God uses this movement with Carey and the help of Fuller, this Baptist missionary assignment, to begin from 18, 1793 to 1865. Every, almost every coastland, virtually every coastland was reached. And then it moves then to another guy we're going to talk about in two weeks. Hudson Taylor, in 1865, founds the China Inland Missions. Uh, and then it starts sort of the second wave of modern missions. Uh, so from 1865 to 1934 is what we consider the, that, that second modern wave. Um, by 1974, uh, all the geographic locations were reached. Uh, so there was not a country uh, or a, a continent in ni- by 1974 that had, had not had the presence of the gospel, that there wasn't some gospel preaching there. Uh, that leads then to what we're in sort of the third wave of, wave of modern missions, beginning in 1934 up until now, uh, in which the focus is no longer on geographic areas but is on people groups. Um, so that began some with, with Taylor, but if you, you think about a place um, like India. Right, so India is a geographic uh, place. It's a, it's a country. And if somebody goes to India and they share the gospel, we wouldn't consider India reached. Right, even if a lot of people come to faith, because does anybody know how many people groups are in India? A lot of people groups. Uh, and a lot. I don't know how many there are. There's a lot. Uh, I believe the last count. There's a. Uh, 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 I believe the last count that IMB has is like we think there are 65, a little over 6,500 uh, people groups. And so when we say people groups, we mean the distinct culture, language. Uh, that it would be very difficult for the gospel to go from one people group to the next naturally. So in bigger countries and in larger regions, you have distinct people groups. And so we have, uh, we think, I think that 6,500 is the number, and just about over half of those are what we would consider unreached, unengaged people groups. Meaning, if there is a Christian there, we don't know about it. So they're living in geographic regions that are considered reached, but they're there and their people group has never heard the gospel. Nobody's ever gone to them with the gospel. So we're, we're moving into that wave now where it's not about geographic regions anymore. It's not about geopolitical lines, about reaching countries. It's about reaching people groups because there are people in those, uh, in those countries that don't yet uh, know the gospel. And all this flows out of the work that God does through Fuller and Carey and those guys who began the Baptist Missionary Society. And particularly, I would argue, all grounded on Fuller's theological writings of the importance of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and actually calling on people uh, calling on people to repent and believe the gospel. That God uses Fuller, I think, in a way far beyond what Fuller thought he would. This is a, a guy who was uneducated. Later in life, he receives two uh, honorary doctorates from, I believe, Princeton and Yale. Um, so later, he, he, gets the, he gets awarded uh, a doctorate, but he doesn't have any secondary education, doesn't go to school, doesn't go to seminary. This is a man who 
served the Lord until his day, dying day, suffered greatly, suffered under great loss, and yet the, the Lord used him in, in mighty, mighty ways. So I want to hear from you, with the few minutes we've got left, as you've heard about the life of Fuller, uh, A, what questions do you have? Uh, I'm not an expert on Fuller, but I'll answer what I can. And then B, what are ways, as you've heard about his life, uh, that you think, what, what are some things you think we should learn from Fuller uh, and, and should, should be able to take? Why, why spend the time today to talk about his life? What, what things maybe that I didn't mention that you think we can take from Fuller in his life? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's hard to it would hard to, to think it would be hard to think that those fourteen guys in that room when they started that had dreams that it would probably even last till the end of their life, that they probably thought there was a good chance it might die before they did. Yeah, that's a huge deal. So did he split with the particular Baptist church or did he help change there? He stayed in. He stayed in uh his whole life and was uh, part of the impetus to change to help to help them change. Um so at this time, the, the Great Awakening is going on uh, with Whitfield and Wesley and those guys, uh, and they were not well-liked in the particular Baptist church because Whitfield would go and preach to a thousand people and tell them to repent in Jesus and uh, repent and believe in Jesus. And so it was f- partly through the influence of Fuller that helps to get those guys more widely accepted in particular Baptist churches and gives them more of a hearing um, that largely the hyper-Calvinist movement died. Uh, praise God that it died, but it largely died. It's, it's not dead. Uh, I went to high school, actually, with a guy who would consider himself a hyper-Calvinist, particular Baptist, who told me it was, you know, like, I don't, know why, I don't know why you would try to share the gospel with people. Don't do that. Let God do that. Don't worry about that. Um, so those people still exist. They're still out there, um, but largely in particular Baptist churches, it died. Um, and Fuller was a, part of the, a main part of the reason for that. It was largely the work of Hudson Taylor. Uh, it, it was he founded the China Inland Missions, um, and it was sort of that next big sending agency. Uh, we'll talk more about Taylor two weeks from. We're going to do Carrie next week, and we'll talk about Taylor two weeks from now. But uh, largely the work of largely the work of Taylor. Um, and then also, uh, you're, you're, uh, you can see even just as you're moving from 1793 to, to 1934, um, we begin to, to have. Uh, better freedom of movement and information. Um, and so as those things improve, we can get to places we couldn't get to before. Easier, quicker. It's easier to send people. It's easier to send money. It's easier to do lots of stuff. Um, so we see that wave sort of going. And so even to now, it's much easier for us to do stuff now than it was for Fuller when he started. I think what, what strikes me with Fuller is that even though he was somewhat uneducated, still sought to get, he had the conviction that theology matters, number one, and he sought to repair some things that had gone on that was, that was incorrect. Mm. And uh, that's, that's what strikes me for, for Fuller, that he had the, obviously the Holy Spirit moved him to, to try to make these things right. I, every year, I get solicitations from missionary societies. And the first thing that I do is I investigate. Yeah. And I think that's a wise thing to do. Yeah. So what are their theological convictions? What are they actually saying when they get there? Yeah, it matters. Yeah. In our day and age, we put such a high price on the degree, and it seems like I know there are mission training organizations, but you don't have to have a degree. Mm-hmm. But even with the, our organizations, if there is a way to test out, so to speak. In other words, yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the things that I've been encouraged by in the last few years with the IMB and the direction that they've been and the direction they're continuing to go, uh, uh, David Platt's the, the president of the IMB, and he is really beginning to open up more avenues to get people on the field who don't have seminary degrees. So there are still, there are still uh, positions of so region leaders and things like that in which they want those folks to have had some formal training. Um, but he's opening up a ton of avenues. For example, they're really pushing uh, folks who, are, who work for companies who they can work anywhere in the world. And so to say, yeah, and so, yeah, finding, finding self-funded or, or partially funded. So, uh, so uh, they've just started to say, hey, if you can work in Dubai rather than work in Chicago and your company will transfer you, why don't you ask for that transfer? And we'll hook you up with a missionary uh, who's already there, who's fully funded, and we might, we might come alongside and su- supplement some if we have to. Um, but it helps to extend that reach where before we might be able to put one guy in a city because that's all we can afford to fully fund, where now if we can put that guy there, we can get two other families there who are being paid by Shell or being paid by Pepsi or being paid by whoever, whatever their company is to be there. Well, now we've tripled our team uh, and, and really quadrupled if you count wives and family for no real extra money that we're, we're making that, those dollars go further. Uh, they're opening up uh, journeyman programs to go. Um, some of those are going to be longer they are opening up more and more avenues to put people on the field, even long-term, without degrees, which I think is a good thing. Um, they're still going to push people to do formal training, um, but I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a, there's a, a need for it, and you want to make sure that at least somebody's got some formal training to help to provide guardrails. But I've been really pleased at what Platt's doing, finding ways to get people on the field to say we need more people, and not everybody's going to be able to go to seminary. Uh, and if you can, great do it, and then we'll put you on the field. But that's not going to be for everybody. And so finding ways to train those people on the ground and to do other things to get them there, to get them on the ground, which is, I think has been really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. And three, when you're by yourself, three years is a long time to wait for reinforcements. That's for sure. Anything else you want to mention about Fuller that maybe stood out to you? Questions? So I want to encourage you, if you're interested in Fuller, in the back of your, uh, in the back of your book, I put two resources in there. I'll try to do this every week uh, to give you some things if you're interested in a guy and you want to read more about him. Um, There's a book by John Piper. Um, so almost everybody we covered, not everybody, but um, Piper, with the, the help of Dr. Haken at Southern, has written sort of a, a series of uh, short books on missionary figures and theolo- theological figures. So I gave you the Piper's book on Brandard last week in your book. Uh, it's available free on PDF and ebook and all those things. Um, he's got a book on Fuller. It's the same deal, available free. Uh, we'll talk about some that we talked about. Uh, he talks about even there are other theological issues that Fuller wrote about that we didn't talk about today um, that he wrote other books on. Um, so if you're interested in him, I'd encourage you to read that. And I encourage you to pick up the gospel worthy of all acceptation. It's cheap on Amazon, or you can get it free if you want to. If you're fine to read a PDF version uh, and to read through it, it's not a hard book to read. It's not very long, uh, and you can get a, a, a better feel and the flavor for what uh, what, what Fuller did. Uh, let me uh, let me pray for us and thank God for Fuller, and we'll we'll head to service. Father God, we we love you and we thank you for the ways that you work, both big and small. Thank you for. Uh, Andrew Fuller, and for the way in which you used um, him as a husband, as a father, as a writer, and as a pastor. And uh, Father, we thank you that because you've used him so greatly, that not only have many, many people come to faith in Jesus through his influence and through what you did through him, but that even now uh, we get to still talk about him and his life and to hear about what you did through him. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to be faithful, uh, even in small things that we think are insignificant, uh, because we trust that. In the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as insignificant obedience, that we want to be obedient in all things. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be faithful, to preach the gospel, and to call men to repent and believe. We, we pray that even as we go into service today, uh, that as our pastor preaches, he would give the words to say, that he would open up the word of God to us. And we pray that as men are called to repent and believe, that many would today, that, that, that those who are here who don't yet know you and have not yet trusted you, that they would come and that they would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. 
time that they would repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus and today be saved. We pray that that would happen. Uh, we pray that as we go to service that you would help us to, to not be distracted by all the things that may weigh heavy on us, but to help us to, to turn our, our mind and attention and a focus to you, uh, that we may honor you uh, and worship you in, in spirit and in truth. It's in your name we pray. Amen.